Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're going to tackle placenta previa. So this is all about the positioning of the placenta. It's a great example of why location really matters when it comes down to anatomy. So let's kick it off as always with our practice question. Remember, you're not going to get the right answer now. Tuck it away for later and we'll come back at the end of the episode. All right. We have a 34-year-old client. She is at 31 weeks gestation and presents to L&D reporting sudden onset of bright red vaginal bleeding. She denies any pain or contractions. Which of the following actions, if taken by the nurse, would require intervention by the charge nurse? So we have A, applying a fetal heart rate monitor, B, preparing for an ultrasound, C, starting a large bore IV line, and D, performing a sterile vaginal exam. Okay, so as always, let's get into the topic here and actually talk about what we're dealing with in placenta previa. I want to zoom in on anatomy. Of course, we've got the uterus. This is like I want you to think of a big, stretchy balloon. And at the bottom where we have that opening where we blow up the balloon, that is the cervix. The cervix is the doorway out. When baby's ready to be born, that cervix is going to soften, shorten, that's that effacement, and eventually open up, that's the dilation, so that we open up the door and baby can make their way through. So now imagine middle of pregnancy here, we get placenta, aka baby's life support, attaching mom's blood supply to baby's. It gets parked right in front of the door. That's placenta previa. Normally, the placenta is setting up camp somewhere in the upper or lateral walls of the uterus. Again, we've got mom's blood going to placenta, going to baby, and vice versa, but it's usually out of the way. It's up there at the top in that fundus. It's not covering up the exit. In placenta previa, that placenta implants too low, either partially or completely covering the cervical oz, that doorway where the baby needs to exit. So now as the uterus grows, the cervix begins to change, especially in that third trimester. Remember that effacement, that softening, any pulling or thinning of that cervix can cause that placenta that's low lying to just separate slightly from the wall of the uterus. And when it does, that is going to cause bleeding. Now, the key words here are that it's bright red, And it's painless. They're not having contractions. They're not doubled over. It's just this bright red bleeding. That's the hallmark sign of placenta previa. And it makes it totally different from something like an abruption that's painful. We have cramping. We have contractions. With previa, we go to assess the uterus is soft. The belly's not tender. Mom's not feeling contractions or cramping. She just sees blood. Now, we do have a few different flavors of placenta previa. It can be a complete previa where that placenta totally covers the whole cervix. That doorway is completely shut. It can be a partial previa where we've just got some of the placenta over that cervix or marginal and low lying. It's just the placenta is nearby, but just too close for comfort. So now here's where the nursing implications come in. The big takeaway from this episode is that we do not do a cervical exam. None, zero, nada. If someone is even suspected of a previa, you do not go checking the cervix because you could disturb that placenta. So hard no, that's got to stop. And that brings us to our scenario. Let's walk through my most memorable case of placenta previa. I was actually working in mother baby, but I was floated over to the other side, the OB floor that day. And we had a 32-year-old client come in. She was at about 30 weeks, if I remember correctly. And honestly, she was pretty calm. You could tell that she was worried, but she was not doubled over in pain. She was not screaming. She clearly was not in like active labor. So she tells the triage nurse, I was back in the back. The triage nurse took her in, did her vitals, et cetera. And her chief complaint was, I went to the bathroom, wiped, and there was bright red blood. She said about a pad's worth. 
So she's not like hemorrhaging out or anything. Again, she looks pretty calm. She's definitely stable. She tells us there's no pain. She's not cramping. She's not having contractions. She can still feel the baby moving. Again, the triage nurse did her vitals, and I don't remember exactly what they were. They were definitely all stable. So this whole picture of mom is stable, no pain, but we've got bright red blood. She's in her third trimester. This is a picture of, huh, probably placenta previa. Sure, it could be other things, but that is high up on our list. We definitely know it's not an abruption because it's not that dark blood and she's not having pain. So what do we do here? Nursing interventions. All right, we already said, key takeaway, we are not checking her cervix. No cervical exam. We don't want to disturb that placenta if it is a previa. What we do is put her on the monitor. We want to see baby's heart rate. It was reassuring, totally normal. We want to get some labs. CBC and type and screen are going to be really important since we're having bleeding. I want to know what her H&H, that hemoglobin and hematocrit is, and I want to know her blood type in case she needs blood if she does start hemorrhaging, right? And when we drew those labs, we also just went ahead and started an IV in case we needed quick access. The other thing, ultrasound. Ultrasound is going to diagnose placenta previa. That's going to tell us actually where it is located, if it's low-lying, marginal, complete, et cetera. That is the diagnostic test here. So sure enough, ultrasound tech comes in, they do their thing, and it is a complete placenta previa. It's honestly surprising this was not caught until 30 weeks. Most of the times with a complete previa, we find it a little bit earlier. We kind of know what we're working with. And I don't remember the full backstory of when mom had had prenatal care, but we were all pretty surprised like, wow, you're already 30 weeks, totally complete placenta previa. So again, that placenta, baby's connection to mom for blood flow is covering the cervical oz. So that doorway where baby needs to exit It is shut. We've got block in the doorway. And it explains all those symptoms, okay? She felt totally fine. Baby was moving just fine. No pain. Uterus wasn't irritable. Cramping contractions. None of that. Just as that cervix was softening and effacing, little bit of separation from that complete placenta previa causing bright red bleeding. Obviously, the placenta is a very vascular organ, like its whole nature is exchanging blood, right? It's bringing blood from mom to baby, baby to mom. So there's lots of blood vessels there and small disruptions as that cervix effaced and softened, that little disruption can cause a lot of bleeding. And that is the nature of why we cannot do a cervical exam in placenta previa. You go sticking your fingers up there and, you know, poke at that a placenta that's covering the cervical odds, you can cause a massive amount of bleeding and it can go from, you know, not being an emergency to really being an emergency very quick. So what do we need to do moving forward here? All right, we've got our hooked up IV, we've got our labs, like she's stable. So the first thing is we have to have strict pelvic rest. We don't do those exams. We don't do anything that will irritate the cervix. We're not sticking anything up there. We need now continuous fetal heart rate monitoring as well as vitals on mom. We want to keep a close eye for worsening bleeding. So we want to do those pad counts so that we see how much blood she's having, if that's increasing and getting to the point where we need to intervene. So activity restrictions. Obviously, she is on bed rest. She's not lifting. She's not standing for a long time. Anything putting pressure on that cervix is a no-go. We want to like really keep that resting because hopefully, remember, she's only 30 weeks. We want to keep baby inside and cooking for another, ideally, you know, eight to 10 weeks. Well, in case we don't get to that point, you know, 
she is preterm and we're putting her on bed rest here, we are going to go ahead and give her some corticosteroids. Betamethasone is the typical steroid we use here. It helps mature the baby's lungs a little bit quicker just in case she starts to hemorrhage and we've got to deliver this baby early. We're going to just go ahead and get our ducks in a row and do what we can do. So it's usually two doses of betamethasone. Again, that's helping the baby's lungs. And then lastly, how's this baby going to be delivered? Doorway is jammed. They cannot go out the cervix and into the birth canal. So we have to do a scheduled C-section. In this particular case, if I remember right from following back up on her chart, she made it to 37 weeks, started having increased bleeding. That pad count was going up. Baby started having some late D-cells. So they went ahead and delivered her at 37 weeks. Healthy baby, great APGAR, stable mom, no major bleeding at delivery because it was all managed prior. That bed rest, that steroids to get baby's lungs developed, and then getting that C-section. So with all that being said, you've got your anatomy, your scenario. We walked through our interventions. Let's circle it back to the practice question and see if you can get to that correct answer and why. We've got our 34-year-old client again. She's 31 weeks reports to L&D with sudden onset of bright red vaginal bleeding, but denying any pain or contractions. So which of the following actions would require intervention by the charge nurse if she saw the nurse doing this? A, we had applying the fetal heart rate monitor. B, we had preparing for an ultrasound. C, was starting that IV line. And D, was performing that cervical exam to check for dilation and effacement. So say it out loud with me. I know you guys have all got the right answer here. Which of those actions require intervention? It's D, right? Performing that cervical exam. That is a big no-no in placenta, previa, and your key takeaway for this episode. So remember, in our scenario here, we have bright red, painless bleeding, especially in the third trimester. That's a hallmark sign of placenta previa. And until an ultrasound confirms where that placenta is, we are not doing a cervical check. Any manipulation up there can poke on that placenta that's in the way and cause severe hemorrhage. Remember that placenta, very vascular, any minor disturbance can cause a problem. And of course, then we start severely hemorrhaging. That's an emergency. So the other actions, the putting baby on the monitor to see heart tones, the ultrasound, the IV, those are appropriate. Those are all the things we did in our scenario. What would require intervention is if that nurse went to do a cervical check. And again, that is your key takeaway. No cervical checks in placenta previa. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.